With all that introduction, let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. And let's all stand as you read that here. So read that in one voice. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. May you remain true to my name. You do not renounce your faith in me, not in the, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan is. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold up to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balaam to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold up to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden man. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father Lord, I just thank you for giving us your word, and I pray, Lord, as you spoke to the churches, Lord, in uh, Asia Minor, and you spoke specifically to the church in Pergamum so many thousands of years ago. I pray, Father, you will speak to our church, to our hearts, Lord, and to the Spirit, Father, that resides within us to challenge us, to draw us near to you, that we might grow as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I just want to give you a little bit of context. The book of Re Revelation, at least in this part of the book of Revelation, is a letter to Christians. It's not so much about the future and like the end times and stuff, but it's a letter to Christians in that context to, to encourage them on their perilous journey of following Jesus in a society that was increasingly becoming more dangerous and more hostile uh, to the way of life that Jesus commanded and the way of life that Jesus exemplified and that he modeled. And in this vision received by the Apostle John, who was probably around in his 90s at the time, on the island of Patmos, uh, when he was exiled, he was instructed to write this to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. And this church, this letter, this passage that we read, is the letter that he wrote to the church in Pergamum, which is the third church in this kind of series of seven. And I'm not going to spend too much time unpacking this passage and going line by line, but I would rather I want to draw out some of the main points of what Jesus makes to this church, and to apply, make that application to these points in our context today. Um, so I have here a picture of the ruins of Pergamum. It's overlooking this, the ancient city, the ruins of this ancient city is overlooking, yeah, there's like a watermark, so uh, is it, overlooking uh, the modern day city of Bergama, which is very similar um, in, the, in the way that it's uh, pronounced and said. So these are the ruins of it. It was a very prominent city, had a lot of, you know, there's an Acropolis, had many temples, as do many of the Greek, um, Greek cities at the time. Uh, and also one of the features of it is that it was very prominent in emperor worship. So there was this emperor, uh, the temple to the emperor Trajan at the time, who was the emperor at the time of the writing, and they would worship the emperor, which was very common in Roman practice. And as the years grew, as Christianity um, you know, as the Caesars also grew their reign and their dynasty was more established, uh, emperor worship became more and more an, an important thing. And Pergamum was a city of prominence in this emperor worship. So a few of the things that I wanted to point out about today's passage is, right from the beginning, it calls um, Pergamum the throne of Satan, right? I know where you live, it says in verse 13, where Satan has his throne. And then it continues on at the end, it says, who was put to death in your city where, where Satan lives. And I'm not sure what exactly um, John meant by Satan living there. Um, but as I said, um, and scholars aren't sure what that means either. It was a pagan city. It was a city that worshipped the Greek gods. But as I mentioned, it was very prominent in emperor worship. And in this time, uh, the emperor Trajan was stepping up his persecution of Christians. And as he was first stepping up this persecution of Christians, it was very easy to understand that Christians would see the emperor as an anti-Christ, like an anti-Christ, 
uh, an anti-Christ, but someone who is against Christ, Christians, against the way of Christ. Uh, and Satan, which means the adversary, the, the one, the enemy, right? So he is the Antichrist. So uh, Satan, the place where Satan is, is this place where emperor worship was so prominent, and this was the center of emperor worship in that area. The second thing that we see is Christian perseverance. It says, uh, yet you, in, in verse 13, it says, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city. So, it seems that there was this uh, persecution where people were being imprisoned and even killed in that city, and yet these Christians who were part of this church in Pergamum were, were faithful to Jesus. They didn't renounce him, they didn't turn their back on him, and they remained true to the way of Christ. Um, it was an encouragement given to this church, uh, saying, you know, you guys are doing good, you know, you guys are remaining true to me. And so whoever was counted as part of the church, Jesus wanted to encourage this church. But then it goes on, it says in verse 14, and nevertheless, I have a few things against you. So it's like the good news, bad news situation. Like, you know, you always want to start with a encouragement. You did really good in this, but, and then this is the big but that comes after. Um, the teachings of Balaam. Uh, it says, uh, there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Now Balaam was this, Pagan prophet, and he's more famous about his donkey, right? You know, have you guys heard the story of Balaam's donkey, where Balaam was going to prophesy against Israel, and he was riding this donkey, but because uh, an angel of the Lord stood in his way, and the, but the Balaam couldn't see it, but the donkey could, so the donkey would not go forward, and then he kept on beating this donkey until the donkey turned around and talked to um, talked to Balaam and told Balaam, "There's an angel of the Lord. I cannot go further." And so, you know, Balaam's donkey is very famous. It comes up in the book of Numbers. But he was a foreign prophet. He was not an Israelite. This guy was not. But because as a prophet in those days, they had access to the supernatural. And he was paid. He was kind of hired by this uh, Moabite king uh, called Balaam. And Balaam hired him to prophesy against Israel. To say bad things about Israel. But every time... Balaam went to the Lord and prophesied, he was always blessing Israel and cursing the Moabites. But Balaam couldn't control that because he was a prophet as a prophet. He was this messenger, this conduit. And he wanted to kind of keep that um, status as a prophet. So everything that he received from God, he prophesied, which was a blessing to Israel and a curse to Israel's enemies, which was Balaam. So on the side, what Balaam told this king, this Moabite king was saying, you know, okay, I can't prophesy against them, but if you get your women, the Moabite women, to go and seduce the Israelites and to intermarry with them, and then you can get them to uh, join in with your pagan festivals, and rather than fight against them, you can slowly tempt them away from Yahweh, which was the God of Israel. So um, he advised this king, not as a prophecy, but as a strategy, to seduce the Israelites and cause them to partake in these pagan feasts with meat sacrificed to idols. So this is the teachings of Balaam. Uh, and then later on it says, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And, um, so no one knows what these teachings are. Um, uh, it's a, I guess it's a cult or a, 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 a false teaching path within Christianity that was totally killed off or you know, they, they, they don't exist anymore. Um, so we don't know what these false teachings were. But to the church in Ephesus, right at the beginning of the chapter, of chapter 2, it says, he commend, uh, Jesus commends this church, he says, you hated the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And yet, the church in Pergamum saying, you, are, you have those in your number that hold to these teachings. So what it kind of shows is that there is this teaching, this, this interpretation of the gospel, this this understanding of Jesus that wasn't so obviously anti-Christian to totally reject it, but it was more insidious, it was more discreet, it was a little bit more ambiguous, that there was this subtle doctrine or the subtle teachings that would cause them to stray from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. These Christians at Pergamum, they were rebuked for holding on to these subtle 
uh, false gospels. These gospels, that, these false gospels that weren't so overtly anti-Christian. And while the Ephesians they loved the sinner and they rejected this teaching for the church of Pergamum, they loved the sinner and they accepted the sin. They accepted this teaching. Another thing that's interesting to know. Uh, in between the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans is this. Uh, the word, there's, there's a word for this happening. Balaam means he destroys the people. And the Nicola, Nicolaus, which is the, called the, the root of Nicolaitans, it says he conquers the people. And so these twin dangers, the uh, teachings of Balaam and the teachings of Nicolaus, they would destroy and conquer these people. And it's kind of funny how that works, right? Especially to the church in Pergamum. That there was this church that was so fervently attached to the way of Christ that when there was persecution, they would fight against this. They would stand true to the persecution that they faced. Physical pain and persecution and oppression were not things that could stray them away from Jesus. Yet, in this city that was that Mecca of emperor worship, when this persecution came, it wasn't the physical dangers that caused them to stray from Christ, but rather it was these dangers of these false teachings, the teachings of Balaam and the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And if you look at the teachings of Balaam, Balaam is all about compromise, right? You marry these women and you allow them to join in with your religious uh, you know, activities, and you join in their religious activities, and uh, the word for that is syncretism, right? Syncretism is basically, uh, it's the mixing of Christianity with any other religion. And you see syncretism everywhere. Actually, when I went to Cuba uh, for uh, my, I went there for missions, and I went there for vacation, and I also went there for an exchange. I went three different times for three different purposes. The first time I there was on, on an exchange, and they taught us about uh, the, the Afro-Cuban religions. And these Afro-Cuban religions were the religions of the, uh, the spiritual practices of the slaves that were brought over from Africa. And they had all these gods to all these different people. And because they were slaves, they weren't allowed to worship these gods. Uh, because it was the Spanish that enslaved them and then brought them to Cuba. They, the Spanish, you know, being, uh, being who they were, they were horrible people, colonizers, they... Uh, forcefully converted uh, by the sword all these slaves that they came over. So these African, uh, these African people, the African slaves, as they were working in the fields, in the sugar fields, and the cotton fields, and mining these gold, as they were working it, uh, as slaves, the way that they would worship was they would take a African god or spirit, and they would find the um, the equivalent saint in the Catholic religion. And they would say, oh, I'm worshipping, I'm praying to the saint. And they would make the two equal. So they would pray to the saint Lazarus, right? Who was like the guy who raised from the dead. And they would have a, a corresponding God, African spirit, that would bring about healing and, you know, health. That way. You know, Lazarus being raised from the dead and this, this African God of healing. And so they would actually be worshipping this African God. And that's why sometimes you'll see like black Marys in Cuba. Because it wasn't actually Mary that they were worshipping, but rather this black fertility God, goddess. And there was this whole, this whole religious system where in, on the outside of the terminology and the way that they worship is all Christian, it's all Catholic, and it's all according to the, the ways of the church, the Catholic church at the time. Yet what they were worshiping, the heart of what they were worshiping was actually their African gods. So syncretism. And so these dangers of syncretism and also uh, theological liberalism, the compromising core of the foundational uh, tenets of Christian faith, and the watering down of faith and the cheapening of grace that we see in the teaching of the Nicolaitans, who were uh, who, this doctrine that was subtly, subtly non-Christian, subtly anti-gospel. And when I think of this story, um, uh, think of what's happening in this church in Pergamum. You know, I, I'm reminded of the story. The, do you guys know the story of the, the fable of the sun and the wind? The wind and the sun, you know, the sun and the wind, they were disputing which was stronger. And suddenly they saw a traveler coming 
down the road, and the son said, I see a way to decide our dispute. Whichever of us can cause that traveler to take off his cloak shall be regarded as the stronger. You begin. So the sun retired behind the cloud, and the wind began to blow as hard as it could upon the traveler. But the harder the wind blew, the more closely did the traveler wrap his cloak around him, till at last the wind had to give up in despair. Then the sun came out, shone in all its glory upon the traveler, who found it too hot to walk with his cloak off. Cloak on, so he took it off. So the sun won. Okay? You guys heard, 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 heard this story before? My son had it in his um, his uh, curriculum, you know, those uh, math part, you know, English part. He had curriculum, so that's, that was, this was the first kind of story that came to my mind as I was reading this passage. And it's fun to de deconstruct these old fables and these old tales, right? Like the, the hare and the tortoise, you know. It's, it, it's, traditionally, it's supposed to be, you know, slow and steady wins the race. But now we look at the hare tortoise, it's actually better to do the hare and just take that extra step. Right? And then you rest after you cross the finish line, right? You just have to be faster. The hare is naturally better than the tortoise at this race, right? Or uh, how many of you guys older, old enough to know uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Yes. Yes. Okay. I wasn't sure because I'm totally dating myself, and uh, the only other people that are as old as me are there. They grew up in a different country, Korea. So I was kind of worried that I wouldn't be. The, no one would know this reference. It was this like game show, this kids game show where these kids would have to look at these clues and Carmen San Diego was a thief and she would steal like the pyramids or like some big landmark and then you'd have to follow these clues to find out where in the world is Carmen San Diego, right? Um, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was on Netflix or something, but I recently saw a trailer, they remade Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. But this time Carmen San Diego is not the thief. She's this honorable thief, and so she only steals from other thieves. And so you, she's, she, suddenly she's become the good person. In, back in the day, Carmen San Diego, she was the bad person. You wanted to catch Carmen San Diego. So the way that we twist all these uh, old stories to make them interesting, and I mean, we, and we de deconstruct all these stories. So I want to do that to this story, The Wind and the Sun, right? So as we just deconstruct, the, the traditional message is, you know, if you're kind, kindness has more effect than uh, severity, right? But if you were looking at it, the wind and the sun, they're both trying to uh, force their will upon this man, right? They're trying to take, to manipulate this man. And the wind does it through brute force, while the sun does it through manipulation. So the lesson for today Instead of kindness affects more than severity, maybe, you know, not all manipulation is forceful if we were to de deconstruct it. Yeah? You guys agree with me? No? No. Anyways, I think it was this way for the church in Pergamum. That the obvious forceful manipulation and getting them to change their ways by physical abuse and persecution did not work for the church in Pergamum. They would not give up Christ because of physical persecution. But it was the colonization of the culture around them, that infiltration of ideas that were contrary to the gospel. And in our context, I feel like we are facing the same things. We don't face physical persecution. That's not a problem for us. If you say you believe in Jesus, no one's going to stone you, or no one's going to, uh, you know, cause you to, uh, you know, lose a job. As long as you're kind of you're okay, you know, uh, there are ways that yeah, you can probably lose your job by saying you're a Christian. But there's easy ways to get around that, right? You're not going to be homeless and you know be imprisoned or because of your Christian beliefs, as long as you're not a jerk about it, right? But rather, we're in this danger of being either too cloistered, like just Christians among Christians, or that we are so permeated by the culture that the end of who we are and the beginning of society, that we can't be differentiated between church and culture. When I look at our church, I think we've done a lot and gone really far in our first year. In our first year. But now we have to get to that next level, that next year. You know, 
in the remaining time, I'm just going to take a look at our church. You know, if, if you look at our, some of the usual metrics for measuring kind of church health and stuff, you know, attendance is one of them, right? And our average attendance over, outside of the first few weeks when, you know, we first started and, you know, we had a lot of visitors coming in, and uh, like my mom and my, my, my aunts were coming in and some of the, you know, deaconesses from, you know, our old, old church were coming just to check us out and to support us. Once all those people kind of filtered out, uh, and other special days like Easter and Thanksgiving, we hit 70, which was amazing. But we were about mid to low 30s, right? That was our average attendance at the beginning of the year. And now, today, like in the last kind of last third of, of 2018, we're kind of mid to high 30s. So we, we gained in about you know, two, two to three people, right? Which is not bad. And, and regularly we would talk 40, right? And we'd have our really low days of 30. And that's okay, right? Uh, another metric is our giving, right? Our offering. If we look at our offering, uh, it has been pretty consistent uh, throughout from January to, um, to the end of the year. I, earlier in the year, we had a lot of people, like I said, who were coming to check us out. They would support us financially a lot. Uh, but now we're averaging around 2200 bi-weekly, um, which is, it's okay, like, we're, we're consistent, uh, kind of going down with, you know, <laughs> economy and whatever, I don't know. <laughs> but I think the other, the, these other numbers are the most challenging. I was looking at our directory, and we have a list of everyone who signed anything that, you know, that they came. We have 94 members on that list. 94 people that have come out these points, newcomers, leaders, whatever. We have 15 leaders, um, we have 35 members, but only seven are serving in any capacity outside of the leaders. And the rest, they're all either inactive members or they're visitors who've come less than four times. Some of you guys are here right now, so maybe you guys were bumped into them. But, so we have nearly 100 people um, who have come at least once. And a bit more than a third of that are attending on any given week, which is not bad. But only 20% are serving in any capacity. And if we count the 50 people who are regular attendees and regular members, those percentages double, but if you want the percentages double, you have to ask the hard question. You know, what about the other 50 that have come, and why aren't they coming anymore? And that's just about the numbers. You know, in other categories of like attendance and serving, giving, sharing, like inviting other people to come. I think it's about this ownership over this church. The participation in the body of Christ, in, in, which is the church. That we need to have more ownership and participate more. It's, and it's not my intention to give you guys a guilt trip or to go, and it's not my goal at all. Rather, I just want to show you the opportunities that we have as a church to grow. That this 50% leakage, you know, they call it leakage, that you know, we're losing people out the back door, this 50% uh, leakage is an opportunity for growth. That we want to see every person that comes into this place so engaged and so um, wowed by the community that this gospel of Jesus Christ has formed that they would want to stay and come and serve and give. Or, or the service, you know, is 20% that are serving. You know, it's, which is better than a lot of other churches. A lot of other churches, it's usually that 1090, right? right? 10 people, 10% uh, of the uh, congregation is doing 90% of the work. But we are at 2080, right? but rather to increase in the number of people serving. Now next week I want to go into the specifics of how we can grow as a church. As we set our, our goals as, as a church in 2019, our fo focuses or foci, foci, whatever you want to say, um, of our church in prayer and in evangelism and compassion. But for now, I want to ask you the question, are you guys, or are we, caught up in the facade of looking like a church, of looking like a Christian, rather than actually being one? Do you also want to take this next step 
to hit this next gear. In this upcoming month, we're going to launch small groups. And we have had small groups uh, through the later part of last year. But we want to officially launch small groups, where as many people you know, uh, who are a part of this congregation will be a part of the small group. And we'll be going through a curriculum together. And we'll be in the same heart and same faith, all, all together as a congregation. Please, join these small groups. And if you really want to make the most of this church, to have ownership over it, and to participate in what we're doing, we have small groups, and we'll find one that works. Join a small group. We have serving opportunities. No, it's the same people every week, setting up, tearing down. Same people on praise. We have a children's ministry now, where it's only one person, Erica, that is doing all the serving. There are many opportunities to serve. Just ask. Give. We have so many ways to do it. If you don't carry cash, like none of us do, you know, I feel so bad sometimes when... Someone, you know, a street person comes and asks me for money. I have no money, right? I just don't carry cash anymore. But there's so many opportunities to give. We can e-transfer us. <laughs> Check. <laughs> cash. I don't know. E-transfer, you can do it any time during the week, right? But give faithfully and generously. You know, whatever it might be. Serving, attending, growing, giving. You know, reaching out, inviting people to join our church. Let's just grow. Let's grow deeper into that relationship with God, deeper, deeper in our intimacy with God, and be the church that Jesus died for. Not the church that the world wants us to be, that the world is tempting us to be. Not a, a quiet, you know, a moral value factory where Christians are these nice, you know, good citizens but a church that is radically committed to the kingdom of God and the gospel message that Jesus died for people so that they can have a relationship with Him and live the life that God intended as He created this world. If we truly want to stand up and remain true as the church in Pergamon was commended for being, but rather not just our outside, but the inside. And be a part of what God is building here at this church. I invite you. We have prayer cards. I thought I had one with me. But we have prayer cards. Just, let's pray together. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. There's these little, small little pink cards. Share our prayer requests. Let's, let's read the Bible to them. Let's read the Word of God. We have our... Um, our Bible reading plan, these are our prayer cards. Nice and simple. Name and prayer request, that's all you need. We have our Bible reading plan. It's made for you guys. Made for the millennial Gen Z. It's only five days out of seven, right? If you screw up two days, you have two days to catch up. Even if you missed last week, you can catch up in two weeks. It's made for you guys. Let's, let's do this together. Let's be a church that God really desires our church to be, and not just have this form of church, these seats and cameras and, and speakers and, you know, preachers, no, no, not, not this, but a church that really loves each other and that loves God. Let's pray.